standing in what's known as a smart house, a home where computers constantly monitor a whole range of conditions and where blinds, awnings, air conditioning and lighting automatically adjust to maintain a perfect living environment. It's also one of the most expensive houses in Australia, three levels of total luxury, and it's home to recruitment industry doyen Julia Ross. In a moment, we'll meet Julia and learn how she's become one of Australia's most successful self-made women. We'll also see more of Julia's beautiful home and hear how, believe it or not, she's got a few renovations in mind. Julia Ross is one of Australia's wealthiest self-made women, a remarkable achievement in the tough personnel and recruitment industry, and one which has brought Julia a high level of material comfort. But success and good fortune haven't simply fallen into Julia's lap. She's needed focus to achieve her place at the very top of the corporate ladder. Julia's drive, determination and entrepreneurial spirit led her from humble beginnings in England to Sydney. In 1988, she opened her own recruitment company in a tiny Pitt Street office with just one assistant. Today, Julia Ross heads up a multi-million dollar recruitment empire and rubs shoulders with the rich and powerful. Ross Human Directions now has offices throughout Australia and the United Kingdom. Julia's outstanding success has also allowed her a remarkable lifestyle. She recently purchased Villa del Mare, a luxurious Mediterranean-influenced mansion. At just over $21 million, it's one of Australia's most expensive homes. Rooms are stylish and elegant with expansive views of Sydney Harbour and the skyline. In fact, it was these beautiful European star windows that initially caught Julia's eye. I've been looking for about four years um, and um, like my house in Bellevue Hill, but um, it really needed renovating and I'm not one of those people that can do massive renovations and, and live in it. And, um, you know, thought it would be easier to go and find another. So I'd looked but couldn't anything and had no intention of buying anything of this price or this size. Um, so um, looked and looked and looked and of course I walked in here and I've always loved these windows um, and it uh, reminded me of home and there was so much about the house that just felt immediately comfortable. Julia, tell me, I mean, it is a big house. It's got to be filled with a lot of furniture. Did you have to buy a lot of furniture when you came here? Um, I didn't, actually. I bought most of the things from my previous house. I bought a couple of pieces, but um, no, not really. Um, it's amazing. It, because it's um, so panelled, um, you don't actually need a lot. In fact, I probably would like to simplify the rooms down even more um, because I think the house is lovely on its own. I yes. think uh, less is more in a house like this. Julia was born into a large working class family in Staffordshire, a tough mining district in northern England. In Julie Mary Strain, she was the youngest of eight children. Her father was a builder on a modest wage. With so many mouths to feed, money was often scarce. But despite the frugal times, Julia recalls her early childhood with fondness. What are your strongest memories about those days? Probably all of the children um, fighting, I suppose, <laughs> running around, throwing water over one another or doing dreadful things, and yeah. mother trying to corral us. And then, because it was England gathering around the fire and really talking about what we were going to do when we grew up, that was, you know, the best part. Was it tough at any time? Yes, um, unfortunately my mother left um, my father and um, took us with her, so that was extremely tough. <laughs> she, was, she was pretty courageous, wasn't she? Yeah, she's um, a bit formidable, my mother. <laughs> yes. And how did she manage? Um, well, the older ones, of course, could um, contribute. They were already grown up. Um, some of them were at work mm. and um, some of them were able to help with the younger ones like me yeah. um, so in that way she she managed the situation but it certainly threw us into a little bit of financial trauma 
those strengths that you saw in your mother, did they inhabit the rest of your life? Um, I don't know that um, it was witnessing um, mother that much because uh, the gap was so big that my, um, particularly one of my sisters, uh, spent a, a lot of time with me and had a huge influence on me. Even as a young woman, Julia showed signs of being a high achiever. After leaving school, she became a desk clerk with a local construction company, hiring out forklifts and other machinery. Julia's intellect and ability were quickly recognised and she was rapidly promoted through the ranks. But after 10 years in the construction game, Julia decided to change careers. She landed a job with the British recruitment firm Alfred Marx. Was it a defining moment for you moving into that industry? Did you suddenly think, I'm home, this is where, this is where I'm going to spend the rest of my life in this business? Um, not really. No. Um, I think my life has always sort of ebbed and flowed. People think I had some grand plan um, at various parts of, of my life and it's quite scary when I say um, <laughs> well I didn't really um, I just kept just you know, <laughs> putting one foot in front of another and um, working hard and, and doing what I do. Julia's dedication paid off. She was transferred to Sydney as head of Alfred Marks Asia Pacific <laughs> Operations. It was a senior role and a goal. She had a company house, a company car, and made some great friends. Julia even got married. She was settled in Sydney and on top of the world, but then a row with her boss shattered everything. The guy I worked for was the sort of person who put his feet up on the table um, most of the day, and um, I was running around um, doing most of the work. So mm -hmm. one day we had a little clash and I, um, being headstrong like I am, put my keys on the table and said, well, if that's how you feel. Goodbye. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Only to realise that the keys to my house and my car and <laughs> they on were the on the same <laughs> key ring. Um, and I'd uh, unfortunately split up with my husband a little um, while before. Did you try to revive the marriage? Yes, because I'd, I'd flown back to England in between time and mm. um, went to see my best girlfriend. You know, I'd come out to Australia, I liked it, and um, but of course I'd put the keys on the table, so <laughs> um, no job and no marriage. So I, I went back and said, uh, what do you think I should do? And um, she said, you're doing some very strange things. You keep eating some strange food <laughs> and doing some very peculiar things. Um, will you please do a test and just check that you couldn't be pregnant? And um, sure enough, uh, yes, I was. So I flew back um, to Australia to try and um, make um, amends and, um, you know, have a go at the marriage. But uh, unfortunately, it didn't work. Mm. So then I was back in Australia um, with no job, no house, no car, Barefoot no and husband pregnant. <laughs> and pregnant. Gosh, it's a triple whammy, <laughs> isn't it? With no job and few prospects because she was pregnant, Julia took the biggest gamble of her life. She sold everything she owned, raised $100,000 and started her own recruitment business. It was in 84 mm. Pitt Street. That was the, the first little space that we had. We used to run across the room and put the I phone in, <laughs> in the drawer to pretend we had a switchboard and sort of all sorts of stuff. So that was quite, um, quite good fun, but very worrying, very concerning times. Um, I was very worried that I was going to run out of cash because uh, it's a negative cash flow business. Mm. Um, when you're renting temporaries out particularly and you're paying their wages and then waiting for the client to pay you so your money gets eaten up quite fast. So how did you cope as a single mum? Um, it was extremely difficult to start off with um, and again a very um, traumatic time in life. I think um, James wasn't particularly a good sleeper, but whether that's because I was so stressed yes. and causing that, I don't know, but um, staying awake most of the night and um, then having to go to work um, became very, very difficult. So that was um, 
particularly stressful. You had a nanny for James? I did, but she worked during the day when I was at work and brought him to me, um, you know, for me to feed or I'd run up Quarry Street to feed him where <laughs> I lived at the time. So um, she sort of clocked off um, after daytime, so that was quite hard to get home and uh, look after him during the night and then work all day. Coming up, talks about growing her fledgling business, her struggle to list on the Australian Stock Exchange and the attitude of some serious suits at the big end of town. Very often they would direct all their questions at all the males in the room. <laughs> the board had only been with me for a few weeks, so I don't know who they thought had been running the company for the last sort of 12, Whatever. 13 yes, years. Exactly. And Judy reveals as a boss, she can be pretty tough. Unless someone sets the standard, um, you know, things will find their own level and often that won't be the sort of level that you want them no. to find. That's coming up when we return home with the inspirational Julia Ross in her truly remarkable home right after the break. I'm at home with recruitment industry supremo Julia Ross in her sumptuous multi-million dollar Mediterranean villa. This palatial residence is the ultimate in comfort and technology. A central computer controls lights, doors, curtains and air conditioning. The system can even be programmed to control TVs and computers. Julia's taste is restrained and stylish. The formal lounge is particularly impressive. For sofas and chairs, Julia's chosen a classic cream fabric, which contrasts beautifully with the rich parquetry floors, vast Persian rugs and panelled walls. Paintings of boys' faces by Sydney artist Cherry Hood have a powerful presence. The formal dining room is another equally generous space with a table that seats 30 people. Now that's a very large dinner party. Outside, an ample terrace allows her informal dining. Understandably, it's where Julia loves to relax on balmy summer evenings. Julia shares her beautiful home with 16-year-old son, James. And despite all the space and luxury of their surroundings, they'll often be found together in their favorite room. So this is your lovely big cook-in, eat-in, family-style kitchen. Oh, wow. It's yeah. huge. Yes, yeah, my favourite room. Well, have a look at the view too. I mean, that's not too shabby, Julia. <laughs> no, it's lovely and it's particularly wonderful at night. You can see the city in North Sydney and you can look back on the house and see the lights it's and any reflected. movement. Yes. Despite her success and now considerable resources, Julia still draws deep satisfaction from life's simple pleasures like a few hours with a good book by the pool. On weekends, she's often in the kitchen, cooking up a storm for mates, giving son James a sense of family by simply being a mum and connecting him with her family of friends. I have a team of uh, my friends that generally come over on a Saturday night and I cook um, and um, we sit in the kitchen and sort of uh, share some nice um, pasta and wine or something together. Are you a good cook? Um, not too bad, I think. Yeah. I love um, kitchens where the family can be there. They can, you know, James can come and throw himself on the sofa and watch TV and um, I can have friends around. It was back in 1988, while pregnant with James, that Julia decided to risk everything and her own recruitment agency. As a single mum and sole breadwinner, the early years were tough with long hours, lots of stress and little sleep. But with characteristic determination, Julia nurtured her business, building an enviable reputation as a dependable quality recruitment service. 
Julia continued to hone her business skills and in later years made a number of extremely astute decisions. In September 2000, after exhausting and intensive preparation, she listed her company on the stock exchange. The move netted Julia a vast financial windfall and made her one of Australia's wealthiest women. Then in 2004, she had the Spherion Group, her major competitor. I guess then um, taking on such a major acquisition um, sort of frightened everyone again. Um, so um, everyone sat back and said, well, um, now what on earth is she doing? Has she gone completely um, insane? But uh, I think it was a brilliant move. It and was I a think great move. Uh, we've done a great job um, to have a company now turning over 360 million um, and having a diverse range of products. Tell me about have. those products. What I've been trying to achieve is that if you are a, a director of um, people in an organisation, whatever your position is, um, that all of the services you would need, that we have built that service um, to be available for you. But being a successful businesswoman has its challenges. Julia's battled sexism most of her working life, first in the construction end and more recently when she listed her company on the stock exchange in 2000. I have to say I had no idea of the work involved mm. to prefer the company to have everything in perfect order um, to list on the stock exchange, the regulations around that. So that was a lot of work. Um, very traumatic because we were to list in the March and then there was the technology crash. So we couldn't come to market and I'd probably spent a couple of million preparing um, through due diligence. So very stressful and then um, I sat and waited and uh, in the August, September time there came a little window that we thought we might just squeeze it through. Uh, I got out there selling the stock and uh, for about two weeks you race around town and see about 10 people a day and try and sell mm. the stock to the institutions and uh, that's mega stress, mega stress. That's mega stress also because you'd again of the suits, isn't it? Yeah. Tell me. Well, um, I'd appointed the board um, previously, uh, so we uh, had some very experienced uh, board members. Alan McDonald's my chairman, and he's a wonderful man. And, um, of course, I took my CFO along to the um, meetings, who's uh, male as well. And um, very often they would direct all their questions at all the males in the room. <laughs> the board had only been with me for a few weeks and they were sort of like, well, I think knows the answer to that. So I don't know who they thought had been running the company for the last sort of 12, Whatever. 13 years. So did you feel ignored by those serious suits, did you? I have to say that I sat back and thought whatever I sell the stock, I mean, who cares? Um, if they want to listen to um, other suits, I, I really wasn't worried. Personal integrity is very much a part of the Julia Ross philosophy. She's passionate about her business and absolutely committed to providing the best possible service to clients. And Julia admitted she has high expectations of her staff. I think I'm tough on um, service levels. I think I'm very um, focused on getting it right for the client. Um, mm. And I don't think there's anything wrong in expecting that of your staff. I think unless someone sets the standard, um, you know, things will find their own level and often that won't be the sort of level that you want them no. to find. So, yes, I am um, tough. I, I am known to walk through reception and um, pick sweet packets up, <laughs> up and, and um, do things like that. I, I like the place to look good and run efficiently, um, the phones to be answered correctly and for clients to be handled as they should and particularly candidates when people come in looking for jobs. Now at the top of the corporate tree, Julia has money, power and influence. She's a generous supporter of charities, seen here introducing US President Bill Clinton at a fundraising dinner for the Prince of Wales Medical Research Unit. So what is the secret to Julia's success? It seems that passion and a strong belief in herself are key ingredients. 
There are a lot of people that do say um, you're not going to make it or this is going to happen, that's going to happen. If you're not able to chart your own way and keep passionate about what you're doing and, and focused and believe uh, in what you're doing, then people will bowl you over. So mm. you need people like that around you who buy into the dream as well and, and feel passionate about it. But despite all the trappings of success and her luxurious home, Julia confided she finds very little lasting happiness in materialism. None of it uh, really brings ultimate um, satisfaction, I think. Uh, it's, I think I had um, just as much fun um, when I had none of those things um, as I have now. And uh, for me, um, being able to laugh and share great times with friends is far more important. Are there any ambitions that you still dear, things that you haven't done that you want to do? Just to see my boy um, grow up and uh, watch him for as long as possible um, and just see what he does with his life um, is my greatest ambition, just to watch him. Julia's extraordinary journey is certainly an inspiration for anyone with a dream of starting out in business. And while she enjoys her hard-won success, it's refreshing to learn that along the way, Julia hasn't lost sight of life's cornerstones, the love and support of family and friends. Well, I hope you enjoyed the show. Just before we go, have a look at this. It's a Nadelman-inspired sculpture, and it's very similar to a piece Julia saw in the Guggenheim Museum. I just love its style and its proportions. It's really a stunning piece, isn't it? Please join me again for our next episode, when we'll once again journey into the homes, hearts and minds of well-known, much-admired Aussies. I'm Maggie Tabra, and I look forward to your company then.